Bibles with you this morning? Five of you. We're making progress. Glory to God. I want you to open them to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning at verse 6. And I want to talk about pleasing God. Hebrews 11, beginning at verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. I want you to notice that without faith, it's impossible to please God. He didn't say it's unlikely. He didn't say it's very difficult. He didn't say it's hard. He said it's impossible. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Here's another way that this could read, separate from faith. Separate from faith, it's impossible to please God. The word without means to be separate from, without, or separate from. Without or separate from faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, theism is the belief that God is. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, for you, he who comes to God must believe he is. And that he is a rewarder. I'm going to talk about that in depth. Theism is simply the belief that God is. Anti-theism or atheism is the belief that God is not. Now these two fundamental ways of seeing the whole of existence determines your life. Because theism sees existence, the belief that God is, as ultimately meaningful. That we have meaning and purpose because God is. In other words, there is more to life than self. I just spoke to you a revelation of the 21st century that could go down in history. It's a belief that life has more meaning than just yourself. Anti-theism sees existence as having no meaning beyond self. Having no meaning beyond survival. No purpose to your existence. Well, those two different ideas create a whole different way of living. Because if you don't believe that God is, then you have absolutely no meaning or purpose to your life other than survival. And survival can look a lot in a different ways. One, just survive physically. Or what about survive from hurt, a divorce? Survive, you're going you're gonna to do everything you can to survive, which usually means you'll work to destroy the other. Or what about nations <laughs> that don't think they have any other purpose than to survive? And, and what does that mean? How do they, what do they do to fight and go to war? And what, what creates that dynamic? This, this incredible dynamic is found right here in, Ele- in Hebrews 11.6. It's impossible to please God without faith. For the one who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Can I tell you the number one reason people grumble against God? Why do people grumble against God? Number one reason is because they think, they believe, they're not getting rewarded. That's it. They think or believe they're not getting rewarded. So they grumble against God. It doesn't matter whether they're in fear, anxiety, or worry. It doesn't matter whether they're in fretfulness or anger. The reward they had in mind is not what they see, and God is not being fair. And I don't even know if He exists. And that becomes the whole question. He who comes to God must believe He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Many times we define reward as three things. Success, And that can be defined in many different ways. Ease. We like convenience. (laughs) We like ease. And thirdly is pleasure. We define reward in those three ways. A success, and you can define that in multiple ways, but 
Success usually is defined, it's a bad definition, by the accumulation of stuff. So if you have a bunch of stuff, if you have a lot of assets, a lot of material possessions, you're successful. That's not a very good definition of success, but it tends to be ours. Success, ease, and pleasure. Most people don't even think about these dynamics, but literally this is defined as the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The very things that we define as reward in our life is associated with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And the Bible says these two kingdoms are completely separate. That's the kingdom of this world. And when you follow the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, you are not, cannot please God without faith. It's actually impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe He is and that He is a rewarder. Now God defines these three things, success, ease, and pleasure as the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Think about Adam and Eve for a moment. They did not come to a point of believing that God is and that He is a rewarder. How do we know that? Well, because of their action. They would have never disobeyed God if they believed that He is because He had told them they would die in their disobedience by partaking of the tree. Secondly, they didn't believe they were being rewarded enough because Satan had put this thought within them. God is holding back on you. He's lying to you. There is more to get than what you have. Now think about that they had to walk through the middle of the garden, and the garden's a big place. The tree was in the middle of the garden, the tree of life and the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the middle. The, the Bible doesn't exactly define how big the garden is, but it does give us an idea because it says four rivers went out from it, and so that gives us some concept of what those our rivers still exist today, so that gives us some concept of its size. I think personally, I can't biblically be qualified to say this is it. I think biblically it was probably the crescent, the fertile crescent that you know about in history. So that would have included, you know, all the way from Jordan, Saudi Arabia, you know, Iraq, up around the crescent, you know, what today we refer to as a crescent moon, but that wasn't the Fertile Crescent, but it's a, like a half circle. So it goes from Saudi Arabia, Jordan, up to uh, uh, Iraq, and then, uh, which would have been Babylon, which the Bible says became the seat of Satan. The seat of Satan, is it possible that the garden is where he took over? So the seat of Satan, and then, and then it comes over the top, and then we come down to Syria, Lebanon, Israel, so you'd have this half moon. I think the garden was that big. I don't know. But the Bible said they had to walk to the middle of it to get to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which means they had to walk through a lot of abundance to get to their poverty. If they believed that God is, they would have never done it. They would have believed the warning that He gave, if you partake of that tree you'll die. In dying, you'll die. So they died, they were separated from God. That's one kind of death, spiritual death. But then they died physically. It took them a while. But then they died physically. The Bible talks a lot about physical death and spiritual death. If they believed that God was present, they would have not, they would have not disobeyed His warning to eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that would bring death. Here's what they didn't believe. God is good. God is good. You must believe He is and that He is a rewarder. God is good. Exodus 34, 6, when Moses passed, which stood before God and God passed by him, he said, I will pass by you in all my goodness. Moses saw the goodness of God. Psalm 34, 6 talks about 
that God is good. How great is your goodness. Psalm 23, David said, His goodness is so overwhelming. Surely goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. Psalm 107 says, There is none good but God. You know, in fact, when you read the Ten Commandments, isn't this interesting that God has a lot of do nots in the Ten Commandments? Just as he said to Adam and Eve, do not. Thou shalt not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day that you eat of it, you will die. What was that? What is that? It's his goodness. It's his goodness keeping them from death. The Ten Commandments have a lot of do nots in them. Do not have any other gods before you. Why? There are no other gods that are good. You can follow a lot of other gods, but there's none of them that are good. So don't have any others. Do not have any other gods before you. Why? There are none good. If you come to God, you must believe that He is good and the rewarder of those who seek Him. There are no other gods who can save you, no other gods who can redeem you, no other gods who can provide for you, no other gods who can heal you, no other gods who can deliver you, who can help you, who can empower you, who can enrich you, who can give you shalom, fullness, peace. Do not have any other gods before you. Here's another one. Don't make any other graven images. Don't do that. Why? There's no good in it. It'll only bring you death. Here's another Don't use my name vainly. How do we use his name vainly when we declare he's not good? We call it swearing. Is there anything that you ever swear at that you consider good? Don't speak my name vainly. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. Why? There's no good in them. The Ten Commandments are really the goodness of God. We think of them as do-nots. They're full of badness, not goodness. That's why God says don't. Faith pleases God. When life is hard and ugly and disappointing and unsuccessful and everything about it doesn't go our way and it's not easy... And then we get mad, we get discouraged, and we don't find the pleasure that we're looking for, and then we get mad at things, and we get mad at people, and then we blame people, and then we blame God, and we don't even realize we're not living by faith. We're not living by faith. We're not pleasing God. We're living according to the lust of our flesh, the lust of our eyes, and the pride of life. And and it screws us. Are you allowed to say that in church? I don't know. God describes it for us in Ephesians chapter 2, this kind of life. He says, you're actually dead in trespasses and sins. You walk according to the course of this world. Oh, there is a course? Yeah. According to the prince of the power of the air. That's Satan. The spirit, the devil, that works in the sons of disobedience. Who was working in Adam and Eve? Many live in this way, the Bible says, Ephesians 2 verse 4. Many live in this way according to the lusts of their flesh. They indulge the desires of their flesh and of their mind. And by their nature, they are the children of wrath like many others. But God who is rich in mercy, with the love that He loved us. Wow. But God. So many things in our our lives need but God's in them. But God. I don't think I can make it, but God. I don't know what else to do, but God. I was given six months to live, but God. I can't defeat this alcohol, this drug demon, but God. This marriage is never going to work. It's never going to last. But God, I can't seem to make enough money. There's inflation is destroying me. I, I don't have the education. But God, this business isn't going to make it. The things are turning. Economy is turning. But God, 
I thought having all the stuff in the world would finally make me happy and give me ease. But God, God, without faith it's impossible to please Him. But God, but God who is rich in mercy with His great love wherewith He loved us by His gift, His grace, we are saved through Faith. Wow. Faith saves you. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. But God, who comes, the one who comes to Him, must believe He is and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. I want to I really, really focus on this for a second because here's why. Many, many among faith camps, I'm going to use that term, faith camps, Faith groups, um, some are called the Word of Faith camps. And, they, and so a, a many people criticize these kinds of churches or ministries that call themselves faith ministries or Word of Faith ministries. And, and you know why they criticize them? Because often faith has been taught in such a way as to Meet the lust of your flesh, the lust of your eyes, or the pride of life. So we've tried to use the faith that pleases God to get our way, to find ease, to get as much pleasure, to find success. Now, does God actually create tremendous provision for us? Yes. Yes. There's no question about it. God is the great provider, Jehovah Jireh. Does God want to help us get out of trouble? Yes. Yes, He wants to deliver and save and out of trouble. But oftentimes, we try to use faith for our own fleshly desires. Biblical faith Biblical faith is a substance from God. Faith is not your denomination. Well, I'm of the Protestant faith. I'm of the Catholic faith. I'm of the Jewish faith. No, that's, that's not even a biblical definition. That's just a group. Okay, so you put faith to it. I don't care if you do. But it's not faith in God. It's just faith in the group. This is, the, this is what we teach or this is what we believe. Faith is not a denomination. Faith is a substance that comes from God. It comes from His Word. Jesus is the Word of God made flesh and dwelling among us. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. So you could say faith comes to us by Jesus coming to Him. So he who comes to God, to Jesus, same thing. He who comes to God, Jesus, the Son, has come believe because faith comes by hearing him here's how Jesus said it I tell you this truth whoever hears my word and believes it has eternal life he won't come under condemnation he ceases from death and he's moved to life what did Jesus say he who hears my word and believes it faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. The Word of who? Jesus. Jesus is the Word, the Logos of God. You can't get around Jesus and not have faith because it's the substance of God. By faith, God created all the worlds. How did He do that? Through Jesus. Jesus is called the creator of heaven and earth and the judge of all of it. So, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, if you hear my Word, you believe it, you have eternal life. Faith has life in it. Doubt has death in it. Faith has life in it. Doubt has death in it. By emptying your mind and meditating on emptiness, which is done by a lot of religions, you are opening your mind to doubt. And most people think, I'm opening my mind to faith. 
But the Bible doesn't tell us to empty our mind. The Scripture tells us to fill our minds with what God says. So to empty your mind is to try to empty your mind of all your stress, all your, all your turmoil, all your conflict, right? All your anxiety. Well, what's that even mean? It means to try not to think on it. So what are you thinking on? If you're emptying your mind, what are you thinking on that's going to give you peace? <laughs> right? What's going to happen is that you're going to be more confused by emptying your mind than by filling it with what God speaks to you. You know, I see this true in every counseling session where I meet with people one-on-one, -on -one, and I see how much difference the Word of God makes in their dilemma, in their, what they're facing, their difficulty, the Word of God. Do you know, even in death, the Bible talks to us about the Word of God is what gives us comfort. It's what strengthens us because death to the believer is not the end. Hallelujah. I said death to the believer is not the end. Now, it might be the end of our relationship with them for the moment. I lost my mother and father, lost my sister. It was sad, hard, hurtful. You know what brought me comfort? They're still not, they're not dead. <laughs> they're, they're alive, which means I'll see them again. Will I have to go without them for the few years here? Yep, that's kind of a bummer. The more I think about that, the worse it gets. Hmm? But then I remember, oh yeah, they're still alive. Oh yeah, I'm going to see them again. Oh, yeah, I'm going to be with them a whole lot longer on the other side than I ever was with them on this side. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, that, that brings me comfort. It still doesn't solve some of the dilemma of losing someone, but it sure changes my outlook. Faith. Biblical faith is a substance that comes from God and His Word. Jesus is that Word. Jesus is made flesh. He lives among us. Anyone that got around Him had faith in Him. And, and the Scripture shows that some people actually rejected Him. They wouldn't believe that the Messiah is. Faith has life in it. Doubt has death in it. Do you have death around your life? Or do you have life around your life? He who believes in me will live even if his body dies, everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Faith has life in it. It has reward in it, goodness in it. He who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So, faith is not presumption. In Numbers chapter 13 through 15, God has told Moses to go in and possess the promised land. That's why it was called the promised land because it was a promise the promised land, and to send in men to spy it out, see what it was like. He's giving it to them. It's theirs. Faith in God takes action. Moses sends 12 men, one from each tribe. The men come back 40 days later, and they say to Moses and Aaron, who is the priest, we went into the land, I'm quoting Numbers chapter 14, we went to the land you sent us, and certainly it does flow with milk and honey and all of its goodness and Here's its fruit. But, it wasn't but God. But, the people in it are strong. And the cities are fortified. And the cities are large. And we saw the descendants of Anak there. The descendants of Anak were the Nephim, or the giants. And they said, uh, we cannot go up against these people. We cannot they are too strong for us. And the land will devour us for all the people are giants. Oh, now, now everybody's a giant. They saw disaster. They saw problems. They didn't see deliverance. They didn't see potential. They were filled with doubt. They had no faith that God is or that He was a rewarder in fact, they said, we should go back to where we came from and get us a new leader who can take us back 
Because God does not know what he's talking about. The problems are too many, too difficult. It's like being in the garden amidst all this. Here, I've given all this to you. Well, yeah, but it's, it's not enough. We, we need to go find something that's better than this. <laughs> the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, pride of life. So they complain against God. They complain against Moses. In fact, they did everything possible to stop faith. And it was coming from Joshua, Caleb, and Moses. They even picked up stones to stone them. Not only did they point out the obvious problems, the fortified cities, the giants, etc., they also began to point out the character flaws of the leaders who were leading them by faith. They said, don't trust them, they'll get us killed. Let's get a new leader who will believe like us because they make us uncomfortable. Let's go back to Egypt where we had comfortable. Really? You were comfortable as slaves? Your flesh will always fight against faith. Do you know one of the things that I was, I've been most highly criticized for in my life is going to hospitals praying for people to get well? <laughs> yeah. I remember one time I was with a family member. They asked me to come up and pray for their father who's dying. And so I, I came up. The, the, the father wasn't part of our church, but I came on behalf of the family member. And I walked into the room, and there were some other siblings there. And so they, I was introduced to the other siblings. Oh, it's very nice. Yeah, our, our sibling talks about, you know, you and your church. We're, we're, we're glad you're here. So I went over and, uh, to the father. He was asleep, and, and uh, so I woke him called him by name. They told me his name. I said, hey. He opened his eyes. I said, hello, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm your daughter's pastor. Pastor Monty's my name. I said, I've come to, to pray for you to be healed. He said, good. Good. I said, do you know the Lord wants to heal you? It's his will because he's good and His mercy endures forever. The Lord heals all. Pastor, how can you talk like that? Because that's, that's what God says. So that's what I said to him. He said, good. I said, I'm going to pray for you. And so I prayed for him. As soon as I got done praying for him, the siblings grabbed me by the arm like they were, you know, you know, like you would affectionately grab somebody by the arm, you know, and you want to talk to them, you know? This wasn't affectionate. They grabbed me by that arm. They led me right out of that room. And they said, what on earth are you doing? I said, excuse me? What on earth are you doing? I said, I'm praying for your father. He's, he's dying. You can't give him false hope. Besides that, his all will is set and we're ready for him to die. I said, well, I'm just praying for him according to the scripture, just what God, I'm, I'm believing for him to get well. They said, that's the dumbest thing that we ever heard of. What kind of a pastor are you? And they went after me for the next five minutes. Finally, I just excused myself. The, the person in the, you know, of, of our church was a little bit, you know, embarrassed and didn't know what to say. I said, don't worry about it. Faith always gets criticized by unbelief. Always. And Why? Because that's not what I believe. I don't believe that God is a rewarder, and so I'm going to criticize your faith. It happens in families. It happens in community. It happens in churches. It happens in, in social functions. Wherever faith is high, you'll find someone who's trying to knock it down. Why is this? Faith has life in it. Don't trust them. They'll get us killed. We need someone else besides Caleb and Joshua and Moses can lead us back to Egypt. Your flesh will always fight against faith. Let me just say that out loud. Your flesh will always fight against faith. What is that? The lust of your eyes, the lust of your flesh, the pride of life. And the reason? Because it brings impossibilities to possibilities. 
But often we speak loudly about faith because we say it's too risky, it's not necessary, let's just go back to our comfort zone where we can, you know, that's what we're used to. I mean, that's, that's the way we want it. We can have it our way. It's Burger King time, you know. It's, it's our way. It's the way, have it your way, have it your way. We don't ever sing, let God have His way, have it your way, God. Faith actually takes a great humility. It's not arrogant by any means. Because of their unbelief, they were warned by God. Because of your unbelief, you're not going to enter into the promised land. And they cried. And then they, here's how they cried. Oh, God, why did you bring us out here to kill us? <laughs> oh, God, this is so un, unfair. Life is so hard. It's, there's no ease in this. Oh, we got to fight giants. Are you nuts? This is too difficult. There's no pleasure in this. God, I, we, we don't even like this idea. So we don't, we don't like, and they cried all night long. Here's what the scripture, here's what the scripture said. They cried all night long and the camp was filled with crying. Doubt always is attacking faith. Hell doesn't want you to be rewarded with the goodness of God. This is why I can't figure out why atheists actually argue against God. Because if he doesn't exist, what is there to argue? I, I don't understand that. You can't be forgiven, you'll be told. Not after what you've done. You can't be filled with the Holy Ghost and pray in new tongues. You don't deserve that. Besides, it's not for everyone. Didn't you know that? You know, you're one of those. It's not for everyone. Some people get it, but not you. Or don't you know that's all passed away? That's not even for us today. Healed. Healed. Are you crazy? What makes you think God would heal you? That stuff doesn't happen today. God is punishing you for what you've done. That's why you're sick. In fact, if you'll stay sick, he's teaching you something by that sickness. And you need to learn it and just stay sick until you learn it. Well, then quit going to the hospital and trying to get well. We come up with so many attacks against faith in God. Here's my favorite one. Well, you know, sometimes God says yes and sometimes God says no. It's a sly attack against faith. Do you know the Bible says all the promises of God are yes? It doesn't say all the promises of God are sometimes yes and sometimes no. And even sometimes maybe or sometimes wait a while. No, all the promises of God are yes. All the promises of God are yes and amen. Doubt fights faith. And you know how it fights it? I'm going to tell you how. With reason. Yep. Feelings, senses. Now I'm going to even make it more with a lust. That's where reason comes from. The senses of our world. The lust of our flesh. The lust of our mind. The pride of our life. That's where it's fighting faith. Doubt fights faith with reason. But God, but God, but God, but God who's a keeper of His word, but God who's all of His promises are yes, but God who will not let His word return to us empty or void, who said it and He will do it and I believe it. The Lord is good. He's full of goodness. He's full of abundant goodness. He's full of extravagant goodness. He's full of good goodness. He's full of great goodness. He's full of abundant goodness above all that you can even ask or think. He richly rewards you. He abundantly rewards you. He rewards you with His goodness. Hmm? That's your cue. If it's painful, if it's outside your comfort zone, if it's beyond what it seems like is possible, you're in miracle territory. That's, that's, that's faith right there. You're in a place where to bring the possible possible. That's your cue. This is God's possibilities for me right here. If He says the land is mine against all of the problems that exist, 
I'm about to experience a miracle. Let's go get them. Yeah, but your reason will say, isn't it dangerous? I don't know. Isn't it too difficult? I don't know. Just shake your head. I don't know. All I know is God said it. I believe it. So I'm going for it because that's the place of miracles. Hallelujah. So it's impossible to please God without faith. Do you know God wasn't pleased with the people? With all their reason, he wasn't pleased with them. He said, for one year, for every day that you grumbled against me in the wilderness, you're going to serve a year now in the wilderness. Excuse me, I got that wrong. For every day that you were circling Israel, spying it out, for one year, for every day, you're going to stay in the wilderness. Forty years. And you'll die there. And your sons and daughters will go in and possess the land. Wow. Doubt has death in it. Doubt always wants to keep you out of faith. Let's, let's stay in faith territory. Numbers 14 says they mourned and cried all night. They attacked what God said. They lifted up their voices. They cried all night. We should have just died in Egypt. We should have just died when we came across the wilderness. Shucks, we should have died here in the land that we are right now. Why would God bring us here to die by the sword? Think about the reasonableness of that. Doubt. They literally fought God's words to them. Have you ever fought God's words? <laughs> I have. I have. I'll give you a good one. No, I won't give you that because that will just condemn me again. <clears throat> no, I'll give it to you. I'm, I'm working on it. I'm not working on it. I'm doing it. Everybody say, he's doing it. He's doing it. I, I think it was probably seven years ago that the Lord spoke to me about first writing a book. So I said, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I didn't. Do you know why I didn't? What difference would it make anyway? <laughs> that was... You say, Pastor, you said that? I've said it. Well, what difference would it make anyway? It's just a book. And it costs money and takes time. And After a year or two, I wrote a little bit. But I put it away. Never would do it. Just too much work, too much money. I know where this is going. But I should do it. You know what I did? I fought against God's word. I didn't have faith. Everybody say, say this out loud. It's going to hurt. Yeah. No, not that. <clears throat> say this. Pastor didn't please God. Yeah, that hurts. But it's better for you to say it than for me to stand up here and say to you, you're not pleasing God. Faith. They fought God's word. Your corpses are going to fall in the wilderness. You won't see the reward of the land, nor the reward that was promised to you. According to the number of days you spied the land, for each day I'll give you a year to stay in this wilderness until you perish. For now you face my opposition. Wow. Now let me finish by saying this. Many people here in America say that they believe God, but they refuse to obey Him. I just gave you one of my own. They say they believe God, but they refuse to obey Him. They complain. They complain while they say they're believing that it's too hard that it's not easy enough, that it doesn't give them the reward that they think they want. I can't find pleasure. I can't find my ease. It's too uncomfortable. This believing God is too hard. Putting others first and serving people, that's not fair. This is the self-serve generation. Since when do I want to believe God by serving others? The greatest in the kingdom are those who serve others. I, yeah, I don't really like that one. So why please God? We mourn, we cry, we complain. And then we discover all the problems that doubt brings us. It causes us with no reward, no blessing. 
And we presume, like the nation of Israel did, that they could still go up and take the land. So when they found out all their problems, they said, well, we'll just go up. We'll go up, we'll, you know, we'll go up and we'll go into the land. Moses said, you better not. You're presuming God goes with you and he doesn't. Many people are presuming that God is blessing America, but he's not. He's not. We sing the song, God bless America. We should sing it, pray for it. But if you look at America, my friend, can you see the blessing of God? It's not, we presume God is blessing us at our own peril because we continue to disobey Him. We fight against His words. We fight against His life. We fight against His truth. We come up with our own truth. We come up with our own belief system when we say, and we ask you to bless it, Lord. We think we can... We think that we can denigrate marriage and its holiness and find God's blessing. We can't. We think we can denigrate life in the womb and say that it doesn't have value because it fights against our own ease, our own pleasure. We can't and still find God's blessing. We think that we can adjust to the world and live like the world and, and live in the lust of our flesh and the pride of life and the lust of our eyes and then say, but... God, why don't you reward us? Where's your blessing? We seek his reward without faith. We're presuming that we're in faith because it's what we want. It's how we'd like it to be, according to the lust of our flesh and the pride of life. Faith in God for his reward is not for your convenience, my friend. People have died for it. Faith in God is not for your convenience or even for your success or even for your pleasure. It's not to fulfill your own lust. Yeah, but won't God cause me to succeed? Yes, He will if you put your faith in Him instead of your riches. For the love of money is the root of all evil. So God warned us, remember the Lord your God. It's Him who gives you the power to get wealth not yourself, so that he will establish his covenant in your life. The purpose of wealth is to glorify God. It's not to confirm how powerful or how strong you are or how successful you are. The purpose of wealth is to glorify God and establish his covenant. It's not for your glory. It's not for your ease. It's not even for your safety. It's not for your consumption. Jesus said, seek my kingdom first and my righteousness and all these things will be added to you. So often we're chasing material possessions and things and then saying, I'm believing God to reward me. God warns us it's the love of money that will destroy you. Don't chase it. This is the, the multitude, by the multitude of his merchandise, Satan was corrupted and sought his own way, said, I'll exalt my throne above the throne of God. What started that whole thing? The multitude of his merchandise. Now catch this, because God says, I'll cause you to succeed. I'll teach you how to prosper. I will above all things that you would prosper and be in health. The Bible tells us that he will actually show us the way to prosperity, that he will empower us for our prosperity. So, should I trust and believe that God is my provider? Yes. Yes, humble yourself and say, I believe that God prospers me. I believe that everything I set my hand to actually prospers. I believe that He causes me to succeed. And I thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Yeah, yeah, believe that. But don't go believing that to satisfy your own desire for success and the pride of life and say, look at how powerful I've become and look at how great I am and I'm so smart and so educated and I have a job that's created so much wealth and look how good I am because of my wealth. <laughs> it's completely contrary to faith. It's completely, con what is faith? Faith. 
is the substance of the very things we hope for from God, the reality of what he promises. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus Christ for the power of faith. I thank you, God, that there is no one like you who speaks his word and keeps it who gives us a promise and watches over it to fulfill it. You're the rewarder. You're the one who's good. And God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for your goodness. We come to you today believing that you is, believing that you are, believing that you are present tense good and that you're the rewarder of everyone who seeks you. I thank you for it. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.